Okay, we're gonna do another Taro City video today. Um, hey, Teeter. Got the 4150 and the whole train of finishing equipment back to the house today and brought the 1950T and the planner over here to get worked on. I think that's gonna be Saturday's project because tomorrow I really gotta get the yard mowed. It's like, it's like that tall now. Um, anyway, our uh, next contestant doesn't really need much of an introduction. He was a he was a crowd favorite in the video from last year of the get together we did. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and say his full name because everybody knew his name from that. It's uh, Dan Euchre. Uh Everybody really enjoyed his story last go around about the Pecker tractor, and uh, he's got a bunch of good ones this time around too. Now that he's got a full now that he's got a full segment to himself, that guy. He is a natural born storyteller and he is a hoot to listen to. So, uh, anyway, without uh, further ado, the crowd favorite from last year, Dan Euchre. Is that on the comment? Yeah. Is that on now? Oh yeah, you're on now. All right, so I'll just start, start rambling things on. So I started December 11th, 1972, and that was an easy one to always remember because we got married on the 11th, it wasn't December, but. Went, drove through a snowstorm to get down there, got my got my trip to the hospital, got all that stuff, and then got taken up. And and uh, it was really a mess because we are just getting going on Minneapolis Moline stuff. And um, I went up, I'm, I'm the new guy here, what am I supposed to do? And he looked at my name on a sheet and he had a card, card uh, three by five card. Oh, you're gonna be the center drive operator. Oh, okay, took me over to the machine and I knew nothing about it, nobody did. It was a mess. <laughs> it was a mess. It was a center drive lathe. The crank crankshafts on that six cylinder minute Minneapolis mobile way, I think like 360, 375. And it had to have a milling process first to go into the center drive to sit. And then two centers came in and uh, we had two of them that were milled. So um, we really didn't have a supervisor. We had a guy named um, Red Fisher. What was his first name? From Rockford, nobody ever knew anything other than Red. He, uh, he, he was not a machinist person. He was a sheet metal person, but they put him on this engine roll because he's gonna get her going and get her done, you know. And uh, he was a nice enough guy, but he was very violent when he wanted to be. So, so we start getting things going, and he says, you "Okay, Euchre, okay, call you Euchre, Dan. I call me whatever you want." Well, first of all, I start going through all these boxes, trying looking at stuff, figuring it out. It says here. It says here you have lathe experience. Yeah, it does. Because they have lathe experience in school on lathes. This is a monster. So I think it probably took a week before we figured out what tools went where. Because the tools were like two and a half inches wide, three quarters inch thick, two or three inches tall. And they were just thrown in boxes. But we don't know what's supposed to cut what, you know. The idea was the center drive, it would turn and just the center lines, your your offside ones would be looped around and stuff. But there was two tables that went in, two tables that came out on the top. And what it was, the theory was, it turned and turned and it gradually went in, you know, and then went slower and slower. And the idea was that it came right down to the spec size it was supposed to come to. And that was turning main journals or rod journals? The, the center drive is what turned it, powered the whole thing. The two centers on the ends were just to hold the crankshaft, so flopping around. So uh, I think it was probably a week or a week and a half before we even got it to that point. Some of the tooling was really bad, so I'd take it to the tools grinders and they'd sharpen them and all that stuff. So then, here we go. Red come down that morning, he said, well, Dan, you got this thing ready to go? I said, yeah, uh, your guess is as good as mine. So he says, well, you got it all in there. It's all ready to go. Push the start button. So that's what I did. Push the start button. And it went, it kind of jerked. And he goes, what's that? I don't know, this is the first time I've seen it. I've moved them in and out before, but not this far. And uh, it kind of went slow. Well, maybe that's what it's supposed to do. You know, we're, we're all green to this. And uh, it got about two inches from the center. And and there's a lot of weight in the crankshaft, so it's, it's your journal is really small. You're really cutting a lot up. And then it went wham real fast. 
22 tools snapped and flew all over. He had to have three cigarettes, I think, because he, so, <laughs> he was so upset, swearing and everything else. So, well, back to back to the drawing board. So, get it all picked up, get new tooling put in. You, we kind of got that figured out. And then we're going to take that cover off that box back there. In the back of the machine, there was a uh, control box that had lobes in it, different sizes lobes. And um, he said, obviously, they sabotaged this before they sent it down from Minneapolis. So, so we worked on it, worked on it worked on it, worked on it day after day. And um, he finally just said, you know enough about electricity, don't touch anything stupid, make any adjustments you want. We need to get this deal going. We need to build engines here. And uh, that's what I did. And then we got to a point where if we can get it maybe 250 thousandths close to what it's supposed to be, we'll just grind the rest off. <laughs> so, so there we go, we were doing it. Like I said, started in December. It was probably January, probably before we really got one that was decent. And then the guy, the grinding guy, was having trouble and just eating up the big stones that are four inches wide and this big in diameter, you know, crazy stuff. And then it then then it all happened. And what it was was we got married in August, so we weren't even married a year. And uh, I woke up one morning. To, my wife was already up, and she was standing there, and she said, "What's wrong?" She says, I, I said, I don't know why. Well, I'm not going to use the word you used, but you said something about that F center line's never going to come in line. And she said, I, I think it's time for you to just go tell them people to figure it out or get a different job. So I walked right in, called Dwayne Byers, who was the personnel director at the time. I said, this is what my wife said. And I kind of want to keep her as a wife. You know, I haven't had her a year yet. So I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking I'm going to quit. No, 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 no. You can't quit. You can't quit. You're one of these guys that's gonna to come to work every day, I can tell that. <laughs> he said, well, then give me another job. He said, all you gotta do is bid on the board. He said, there's 20 jobs on there right now. Well, I didn't wanna to go to the foundry grinding, chipping. I, he said, what are you interested in? I said, well, I've been a farm-related person my whole life. I can drive anything. I said, I can drive semis, I can drive anything. You can do all that stuff? I said, yeah. He says, there's gonna be an outside, they're gonna add another, forklift driver outside of the foundry, but it's castings that need to be stored for machine shop. He says, gonna come on the board next week. So come down, I, I bid on it. Well, then I had to wait another 30 days before they fire, hired somebody to take that other thing. But I just kind of slid through that. And I, then I got on that outside job. It was uh, August before I got on it. And that same guy that uh, gave me the def, def, nah, can't think of his name now. Joel Larson. He, 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 everybody was gone when I got there at 3 30. Okay, I'm going to show you your area, what you're supposed to do, and everything. We're walking through this. It looked like a dirt field, but there was just mud on top of cement. And I was walking instead of watching. I stepped on a board, a nail went through my foot. <laughs> Hadn't even been on the job an hour yet. Now I've got to go to the hospital because he said, hey, You could have a tetanus shop. We're not going to have somebody get sick and get sued and all this stuff. So, we got through that. The, the, the job was a nice job, but it got to be really overpowering because the foundry was running so much harder than we could do anything and get going on it. And before I started in August, and I think it was like the 1st of October, we had so much material around, a fork, big fork tractor had to go really slow going down this, through this because there's so many pallets of stuff. And then they came out with Steve Hill, Steve Hilson was the supervisor. He came in one day and he says, uh, can you work some overtime euchre? Yep. I understand you can drive a semi, straight truck, everything. Yep. You got a license for it? Yep. Didn't have air, brake, air brakes in 73. Yeah, I got it all. So, in no case, he said, so what we're gonna do then, you're gonna work your normal job and you can work two hours, four hours, whatever you want. But we're gonna load castings onto this semi and you're gonna drive out to E Street, really careful, so you don't lose nothing. And then you're gonna go around like Cleveland Street, or you're going to the Cleveland building. And we're gonna unload it and gonna store all this stuff out there. So there was another, another fella that lived right here in Osage and he was on a yard crew. And uh, he knew how to drive a fork tractor too. He, Dave Bold was his name, is his name. He's still alive, I shouldn't say what. He was a farm kid too, so we rode motorcycles together. So yeah, 
So he says, what do you think, Dan? Let's come in tomorrow, Tuesday, 3.30. Let's work till 7 o'clock the next morning. Let's do that this week. Let's, we'll show these old guys that we can do as much or more than they can. All right, you're on. You're on. We're going to do it. So I, I drove the semi, I don't know how many, three, four loads a night because it takes time to unload them and all that stuff. And then I, when they, when somebody else was loaded, I'd be moving stuff around. We, we worked together, three or four of us people. And then uh, some other smart Alex, I can drive a semi too. Go ahead. No, didn't make, from East Street, you went north, a whole bunch of railroad tracks. And then there was a street, I don't know if that was Cleveland Boulevard or not, but he, he, he just, it was dark, it was in the middle of the night, you know, and everybody's sleeping, so to speak. He kind of just slid through the intersection and four transmission cases were on the ground. Oh. I don't know what they did to the ground, to the, to the street or anything, but yeah, that hit, that hit the fan. The supervisor told me and Dave to get out there on forklifts and get them picked up before anybody sees them and all that stuff. So probably the best part of that day was when we got to Osage and had a couple shots of whiskey and then went to bed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then it, that that got over with, and then winter came and it was horrible. It was really cold. That had kind of a cab, but it really didn't do much. So whatever. That was '73 and spring of '74. I'm back to not liking freezing to death and everything else. So I went in and told Dwayne Byer again. I said, "What do you got for other jobs?" And I'm not really crazy about freezing to death again next winter. I'm looking right now. And he said, oh, i got all kinds of jobs. I've got welding jobs and everything else. Really? Yeah, really? Okay. Why? I said, well, I can weld. You pass the test? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. So there we went over. You can. Take that back. That was the wrong year. I wore it back into that welding, the welding building, driving a fork truck. And um, I saw all these guys, you know, welding and stuff. That's nuts. I'm standing there and pull the trigger for $125 a week more than I'm making. So so then I, I got I got a chance to get a test and got it. So that would have been seven spring of 70. I was in there a year, spring of 75 is when I went to welding. And of course the new guy doesn't get the best argon wire clean job. You get the crappy one, you get inner shield. Inner shield or uh, what the heck, it's all shield, whatever it was. There's one that was, there's one that would lay a bead three quarters of an inch wide. It was the wire was three thirty seconds or something, and the core wire is what we always called it. But then we had the mixed wire, which was CO two and a second shield. That's where all the like the front ends, the hubs for the slide out front ends, all that stuff was that way. All the draw bars were made with that that two part. Um, it had one hundred ten thousand pounds tensile strength. So Vern Griman was the foreman when I got the got around to taking the test and everything. He's kind of a smart aleck and he'd take his cigarette and go, fuck it like that and he'd go, to D, to D. Dan Euchre, you think you can be a welder? I said, yeah, pretty sure I can, Bert. So anyway, looked at the test and he said, well, you can weld. Now let's just see if you can make a reduction. And first day I made nine hours and from then on I never made less than 12 hours in my life. Just gotta just know how to work and stuff. He was a good fella, and the crazy thing with their seniority was, um, it was plant seniority. So I've been in I've been uh, in the plant longer than two or three welders that were on days. So I got to bump one of them tonight, and he was furious. You should have been never been able to do that. I said I didn't make the rules, so whatever. Vern Vern turned out to be a pretty decent person to me because I did things for him. There had to be at least three or four different times. I'd be maybe running uh, outer uh, outer members, the tube and the, and the casting on or something. And we had, it was hand, it was all hand. You were moving the welding with one hand and moving it like this circle and all. I was making them one day and about 20 to 12, he walks in and stands there. So you gotta wait till he goes to D to D, hi man. And it was so funny when he, that's how he introduced himself to you. Hey, um, Assembly line's going to be out of drawbar supports at uh, 20 after 12. Mm. They can't seem to find the 60 that are supposed to be around someplace. So they called me and said, Vern, get some down here right now. So he said, I already got the parts coming and the fixtures being moved in. He says, uh, would you 
be a nice little guy and weld up six of them right away as soon as you can and get on a fork truck because you know how to do that too we take them right down you know where they go too don't you and i said yeah i do and uh he said and doing that he said just go ahead and work through the noon hour you know get all done and then when you get done delivering them come back up here take your half hour lunch and turn in a half hour overtime too he said you say you're saving me so did it and it three or four more times or a course of time that that, that happened it just where they couldn't find stuff is crazy, but anyway. Yeah, there was quite a bit of that, especially like over sheet metal where they had so many pieces that went into one sub-assembly. Oh yeah. You know, and you had to depend on, on truckers. Yep. Because they, they put stuff away and, <laughs> and, and they knew where it was pretty much yeah. until they started getting a system put together. That helped some, but it didn't solve It was some. a real rat race because the building wasn't built for the amount of production we were doing. So you have storage tubs, either square-legged ones or, or metal ones. You've seen them, all kinds of them. We'd have them stacked four feet, four, four or five high, and there's only a little gap in them. You can't see, you can't climb on them, and they'll pull over, you know, whatever. Oh, everything goes crazy. Finally, one of the guys said, why don't you put a mirror on a piece of conduit and put a little light on there, too? Well... Didn't have pen lights at the time, but somebody from maintenance figured out a flashlight so we could look and see if we were looking for something. But it seemed like there was always some kind of part goofed, goofed up. It, the, the truth of the matter was we were building more than we could handle, all the different parts. But but eventually, you know, it worked out. Um, I got laid off several times during that, back and forth. I'd, I'd run production from April to September and then Production numbers did slow down. I'm low on the seniority list, so it's, well, you got one option if you want to work, back outside. So I'm back outside all winter. The third time that happened, um, Vern come up and said, you're, uh, he saw me. I drove into the sheet metal or the sheet metal building and, and done something. He walked up, he waved me over and he said, so coming back, what's coming back? Production coming back. I'm gonna need you to come back and weld. No, I'm not doing it. What do you mean? Throws my ass off all winter outside? I'm gonna be out there now where it's nice and nice spring weather and summer weather. You're gonna regret it. Well, that's what I'm gonna do. And I did that one year and then, I don't remember what year it was, I went back and actually got to stay there. It must have been late 70s, because in 79, about to, 10th or 12th of December, 79, I was on the yard crew again, not welding, but Steve Hilson come up and said, big layoff coming, told all of us. And he pointed to us truck driver, he says, you guys will be off two weeks. What do you mean? Well, we're restructuring. And we're gonna be back in two weeks. Yeah, they need all this stuff to be moved. 54 weeks before I got called back. <laughs> That's a lot different than... That's, and, that's a long two weeks. And, and, and when we did, we all got a pay cut when we come back. Err. We took money, we took money out of our pocket. It was a renegotiation deal and all that stuff. But it was better than not having a job. And I didn't like, I didn't hate working there. So you just do it. And then uh, I think I was, I was probably, I'd already got a job working as a mechanic for a farmer when they called and said, uh, we need you to come back. And of course, this guy was furious because you're a good mechanic and I don't want to lose you. I said, well, I'm going back at $8. You want to pay me eight instead of the five you're paying me? No. So he got mad and I went back. That all worked out. Then it turned around. I was building, I was building tractor parts and all kinds of stuff. And had to be the mid late seventies. We came out with four two seventy. I don't remember when, but, uh, the, the tail end of it had a three-point lift for lifting up the machinery and stuff. And um, I can't think. What was that little short guy that was an engineer guy? A little short guy with the brown hair. And, and I can't remember his name. That's not. But he was a pretty nice guy. But I was actually in, built in that core wire thing. So that's what it was going to be. They took a piece of steel about that long, bent it, machined it, and everything else. And then they made a jig. And they wanted you to weld a little block about that, about two and a half, four inches long, an inch thick, three inches high. 
want you to weld that to this bar. And then the down rods on the back of the tractor are gonna pull on that. And the first time he come out there and he described how he wanted it done, I start, I start going like this. What are you doing that for, Eucharist? Said, That's never gonna work. You're gonna put 4,000 pounds of pull pressure back here? I don't care how good your welding is. It's gonna break. It's just gonna break. So we came in with a special thing. We had to preheat Preheat the Biggs bar stock, preheat the little piece with a blowtorch, not just a, I mean a blowtorch. We had that, we had a chalk thing that had to be the right color, and then we welded it. And then we had to preheat it again. And we did like 12 sets of them. 12 sets of them broke when they put them on. The little engineer guy come out and he says, well, that didn't work, what's your idea? Not all, it not, doesn't take rocket science, man. Drill a hole through it. And your cast iron clevis that, that, that is adjustable that comes down, instead of having a slot that long, make a slot that long out of it. It's cast iron, harden it. And that was the answer. It didn't, I never got a medal or nothing. <laughs> I didn't expect one, but anyway, that was one of the crazy, crazy things that happened. And that's just a design thing. And then I thought, you know, okay, this, we're, we're building back, we're making the mainframe 404 220 is called the bathtub. We're making bathtubs. We're making all kinds of fronts and backs, swivels, all that stuff. I was on second shift and on uh, the front where the cab was set on there. And all three shifts, we would run a full 60 pound of wire on a shift. That's how much welding was in one of those pieces. That's a lot of foot of feet of wire, mm -hmm. 60, 60 pounds at old 45. Yeah, so anyway, but it was good. And then... Things slowed down again, and out the door I went. 81, maybe? Yeah. Getting old. Dwayne Byers calls and says, think you can pass the welding test? Yeah. Why? Well, we're going to start building our own cabs. We need certified ROP at ROPS welders. And I've been told to bring in everybody that's out there, and you're out there, so you want to come in and take a test? I said, yeah, sure, not a problem. I'll take the test. So got in there and they had uh, six, it was six inches. You had to make six inch, six inch well. You had to do a vertical up and you had to do a horizontal. You could start and stop as much as you wanted. The engineers from the laboratory put the pieces of steel together. They were beveled at 45 degrees with a one inch strip on the back. And they would let you tack that strip on. That was so you wouldn't run through or run out. And um, you could stop as many times as you wanted, didn't matter. Um, you just had to make sure there was no pinhole. If you had point zero six, what's a sixteenth? Sixty-two, right? Zero sixty-two, a sixteenth of an inch. If you had over that, they took it, you did all your welding, and then they cut it in one inch strips. And they took it and bended it this way and that way, this way. And that, we build it any, every way you could. And then they add up the, the length of all them little spots. And if you went over 0 0.062, you flunked. That's all there was to it. And there was a lot of guys flunking. So, oh boy, am I going to pass this, you know? And I knew the metallurgist guy. He was a younger fellow with really dark hair and had a mustache. You might remember his name, Al, but I... No, and, I didn't. And he watched me. He watched me well. I did my horizontal... Or my, yeah, my horizontal, I did a valley on the bottom, and then I did a root, and I sewed it the whole way, you know, sew it means with a wire welder, and then I did a last one, which was like a hump hill, and I really wired, really sewed that together all, and it was a, it came out about a quarter, three-eighths of an inch to weld out, but that, that was immaterial, because they're going to get down to where your root is, that's what's got to be string, so, uh, and then the vertical up, I just started on one side, and, and crisscrossed all the way up all, all the way up and yet you couldn't take a break once you started you had to continue and then you could stop so I thought well I'll, you know prep a couple days I'll probably get a dear John letter you flunked <laughs> and uh, Dwayne Byer said you need to come down why do I got to take it again all I was told is you need to come down so I come down and you know we're not getting paid you came in on your own on the which didn't matter but Got in there and the metal alert, this guy come over and then the, the man that was in charge of the cab line, Don Hilson, he was a very intense person. He was a sheet metal 
supervisor his whole time he was there. They put him on third shift at one period of time when I was on a forklift to run the whole plant and he had a nervous breakdown. So they, they let him go back to sheet. But he had two breakdowns when I was fork, fork tripping in 74. They walked him out twice. <laughs> he just, he just broke down. Shit wasn't going right. And he, was, he was out. So when I found out that Don Hilson's in charge of this cab line, I went, oh my God, am I in trouble? But uh, the metallurgist guy came out. Don Hilson was there. Metallurgist guy says, you could, you're a pretty good welder. I'm waiting for it. But he says, you passed. You had 0 0.30, half of what you could have had. So you're on. Hilson said, yeah, you're on. Monday, be here. So that's how it started. And there was an older fella, good person, but Rudy Billet from Cresco. He could pass it too. He was a welder many, many years long. And uh, he couldn't figure out how to make money on the bottom, the bottom rails for this, the cab, with the actually bolted to it. And Hilson said, Rudy's going back to sheet metal. You're taking that job. So go in there and see if you can make some money. Okay. Look at the print, design, what do you got to do? Put, put it together, drop your helmet, go to work. Made 11 hours piece work first day, and I didn't get going until an hour and a half late. Rudy stood there and he goes, I couldn't even get half of that many done in a day. What the hell? So he watched me some more the next day. And I was supposed to, he was supposed to go back to sheet metal that Friday. <laughs> and I was supposed to be first shift in there. Hilson come out about 2.30 and said, some bad news for you, Euchre. What's that? Rudy's decided he likes this. You showed him too well. He's going to stay here. So you're going to go on second shift. I said, what? You promised me days right here, and I'm going on second shift? Yep, you sure are. I took my welding helmet off, I was probably six feet from the wall, and I threw it at the back of the wall, and five, six words with F in it came out, broken glass everywhere, and I went over and I just started locking up my tools. That's it, I'm done, I'm going home, you know. Was it five minutes later? He walked around, pulled the curtain open. Euchre, come here. Walked over, handed me a box. Here's a new welding helmet, you're still going on second shift. So, so I did. Three days. So I was, uh, four days was all I was there. I'm, I'm hating every minute of it, you know. But I'm making money, so you know. But I just, I was a hothead. I didn't want to. I didn't want to do what I didn't want to do, you know. And then, and then uh, Thursday morning, about eight thirty, Dwayne Byer calls, and it's the number, you know, on our phone. Oh man, what the hell's on? He says, "Well, Euchre, you win. I win what?" You're going to be on days next week. Why? Rudy going back to sheet metal? No, Gary Smith walked in, told Don Hilson to shove it up his ass, and he walked out the door. So now Don Hilson needs you to be a welder. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, when you come in tonight, there's going to be another truck driver, a trucker uh, around, and you're not going to have to weld. You just watch um, Burrow. Burrow was a guy on days. You just watch Burrow. What he's running because you're going to be in there's two sides i mean they've made cabs left hand right hand side there was two weld booths for that and then they put it together in the center i don't know if you ever saw it was there but he said you, and that's what we needed to do to get six cabs a day built so so i watched rudy or uh burl that night and watched him the next night and just kind of drank coffee and walked around said hi to everybody whatever went in monday morning and just peace worked just like it was supposed to be and don you happy yeah, you better be happy. I'm doing my job, you know, okay. So then I needed to go on second shift for three days for something. I can't remember what it was. But it was building odd parts and stuff. And he had a brand new table, just a flat iron with legs on it, you know, welding table. And uh, he said, you need to do this, 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 and this. You can do that tonight, right? Yeah. I don't like to be on second shift. You're only going to be here a couple days. You're filling in to get this stuff done, so we can get this stuff. Okay, so I was building half a part and another half a part, and I had to have some place to store it. So I went over to the saws, which is less than that, 25 feet across, got some scrap metal, tacked it to the back of the table so I could pile it up there. So I could put one half, one half, and then put it back together. And I left those pieces on there. Oh, my God. 
I walked in the next day, 3.30 start time, but I got there about five after three. He was already as red as a tomato. But he always put, he had more time. He always put his finger underneath it. What the hell did you do to my table? What are you talking about? He said, a brand new welding table and you welded shit on there? I said, my God, Don, that was to hold it together so I could get the parts done for you. You get that fixed before you even get punched in. So I went over and you could bust it by just jerking, you know, and I got a grinder and I ground it all smooth. And I walked over and the day divisional man for machining was standing there on the corner. I hadn't punched in yet. And uh, Hilson looked at me, what do you want? Don, I got your goddamn table cleaned off for you. You don't need to talk like that. No, you didn't need to do what you did. What you wanted me to do, you wanted me to make peace work. You didn't need to make a big, big deal out of it. It took five minutes to take them off. So I'm really sorry you don't like that. But the next time, I'm just going to walk out the door. You go back, you go over and get punched in, and I'll be about to talk to you again. So he come over. He was a little bit lighter, lighter that day, but anyway. What's next? We welded. We figured if we worked six, seven months, that was a year for us because we were off so many times, which was fine. You know, I'm a DIY person. I drew very, very little unemployment in my life. I was pouring concrete, building houses for people, doing my own stuff. I did, I mean, I'm a workaholic, just like my older brother was. We gotta be doing something. You know, I still am to this day. I got a 20 by 28 wood shop that I'm in every every minute I can be there building something, doing something, whatever. But uh, a lot of guys were like that. They always had something that they fall back on during the down times. Yeah. So after after we welded and, and we we uh, there was there's a nine o'clock break in the morning. There was no eleven o'clock break, but we're all peace workers, so we'd sit down and have a coffee or something, you know. Don had walked by and shake his head and get all mad, you know, whatever. End of the day, we still made our 13, 12, 13 hours. He had his six cabs down, going down the line. He should just shut up and be gentle about it, but he, he had to get really funky about it. <laughs> and then we built four-wheel drive cabs, too. And the particular booth I was in was I built both sides, the door and the window side, okay? And then I stacked them on pallets flat. And uh, I was the one person, at that time we only had like six or seven people in there. So I did all them things and I had to be, have them done ahead of time. And then I put that together with a top so it was a frame, you know, like a, well, like a bench with the legs. And then they'd take that over and then they'd assemble all this stuff and everything. And um, I happened to be welding that one day, mid morning. And, uh, I'm welding, and all of a sudden, I can, in the inside of my helmet, I can see reflection. It's Don standing back there. And I lift my helmet. What's up, Don? What's up? Is that what you put down there? What are you pointing to, Don? You know, you did it. Whoa, dude. Take my helmet off. Nice. Don't start threatening me again. What the hell are you talking about? Walk down there and look. So, somebody took a piece of cardboard, drew a picture with markers, because all, we all had markers, and it looked pretty good like Don. Necktie, you know, and uh, some red cheeks and neck and everything. <laughs> White shirt and a tie down. And it says, if the shoe fits, wear it, bitch. <laughs> oh. I said to him, I said, you really think I, how I've talked to you, you really think I'd have to put it on a piece of paper? I said, you better find out who did it because I'm not taking this shit for anything, you know. And, uh, well, away he went, you know. <laughs> the guys that did it were the sanders, where they sanded the cab and, you know, finished them. They were called finishers. The two guys that did it were laughing their ass off back there. And it was in the maintenance booth where they, the correction guy, and Leo was a correction man. He knew who did it, too, because he watched them put it up, but he didn't say nothing, you know. And, you know, this was morning, and a couple hours later, he come back. Well, I don't apologize to anybody, but I'm understanding now that you're probably not the one that did it. You're right. Because if I want to tell you to go to hell, I'm going to tell you in your face. I'm not going to write it down. 
you got to quit being that way. No, you got to quit being how you are, buddy. I'm working for you in this place, and you don't need to treat me like that. So it got worse and worse. I mean, as far as the actual work in there, because we we knew things were slipping. You know, we weren't working all the time, and it's, we're getting less and less all the time. And then, uh, geez, I'm going to guess about January of 88, the big news came out. 90% of the operations are going to go to Ohio. And so Don pulls all us welders, six guys, you know, that's all that's left. Everybody else has been laid off and gone. We're only building six a day. And, well, there's some guys, people coming from Ohio, wherever the hell they're at. He said, they want to watch you weld. They want to learn everything about it. They want to know all this stuff. And they want all you guys to go out there if you want to. And we're all from North Iowa there, you know. We're just looking at each other. Don, or, uh, can't think of his first name now. Randy says, I did a lot of work in the middle when we, somebody would be missing, I'd help put stuff together. Randy and I would do them. What are you going to do, you? What are you going to do? I said, I ain't going to freaking Ohio for nothing. And I ain't showing any of them sons of bitches anything. They come in here and start watching me. I'm going to sit down right in that chair and drink coffee. And when they leave, I'll go back to work. And I did. And John got, Don got pissed about it, whatever. And they were there for two or three weeks. And then they went back and the report was that people in Charles City, Iowa are un uncooperative. And they won't show us anything and everything else about it. And, he, and Don tried to break that news to us. And we said, well, yeah, you know what? You're taking our freaking livelihood away from us. So what do you expect? We're not going to Ohio. We're not, this is our home and all this stuff. So <laughs> we had one more run coming up. And uh, I was looking around. And there's a place in Garner, Iowa. I'm old too. And they had, they had job offers. So what the hell? This is going to be done in two months or less. I'm going to check it out. So I call over. I get an appointment for an interview. And it has to be at 1.30 in order to get it done in the day before the day supervisors go. <laughs> so two days before, I walk up to Mr. Hilson. He's at his desk. And he said, what do you, what do you need, Dan? I said, I need to... I need to come in tomorrow at uh, 3 o'clock, work till 11. Can't do that. That's, no, that, that's, can't do that. That's not policy. Well, I need to. Well, you can't. Okay, so I'm not going to be here tomorrow, Don. And you ain't getting your six cabs in. What the hell? You can't take a day off in the middle of the week when we're doing like this. Said, yeah, yeah, I can. Tell me what you're going to do. Well, that's pretty simple. I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to drive over to Garner, Iowa. I have an interview over there for a welder. You can't quit here. I said, hell, I can't. So I, when the time he came in at 630, I'd had, mo I'd had half my job done because I'd been there since three, you know. Still going over there, huh? Yep, still, still am, yep. You're going to give me the decency of letting me know if you're quitting? I said, yeah, I will. Five minutes before I walk out the door. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of an asshole to him, but I'd taken a lot of crap over the years from the grinding table and and doing all this junk and back and forth. So anyway, uh, um, I got over there and it was nowhere near. Um, the guy, the people were nice, the supervisors I talked to, talked up front, and then I went out and had a welding supervisor. He had a metal Stanley tape on his belt and he took it off and he said, Show me two and five sixteenths inches. Why? Just show me. It's right here. Okay. Then it was like six and three quarter. Show me six and three quarter. Right here. What's that all about? I said, Mr. Euchre, you'd be surprised of all the first class welders that they bring in here and uh, want a job and can't read a damn measuring tape. And we build things custom to measuring specifications and it was it was like two bucks less than i was making at the oliver and i said yeah okay he said we'd leave. i'd love to have you come i said i was still thinking about it till that drive home it's 55 miles from here to there and that's 21 and maybe i'll get something maybe not whatever so i went back the next morning and he was right in there seven o'clock well, are you going to finish working here till the welding stuff done and all that? You know, blah, 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 blah. And he said, yeah, yeah. What'd you think of it? It's oh, an excellent place. Clean, nice people. 
I don't particularly care to work on a measuring tape type thing. I like production, putting stuff together and all that. So, so we went down that road. And uh, time came. Said uh, everybody gets, you got pieces to build and then you got this finished product. So when the pieces to build guys are done, you're out. You're out. <laughs> he gets out. And the second to last day he says, you know, you and I have had our differences, but you're a hell of a good welder, and I really hope you, I hope they come back. I hope, hope they don't do all this stuff that something comes back and we can do it and work it out. Yeah, okay, Don. You know, I'm still going home tomorrow, whatever, you know. So uh, that happened. I'm trying to think of the next sequence. Well, and as far as building this cab, now, did you? They quit buying them from Cranlow then? Oh, yeah, we, they quit buying them from Cranlow in uh, 80, spring of 81, because we started production building them in 81, and we had to have the first production, for, I think, for the Labor Day, from Labor Day on. Make it, and, and we were making, there was two different cabs, a cab for a 2105 series and a 230, 135-55, simply because the transmission mounts were different. And then there was other stuff. And then you got the all round four two four two ten thing. And uh, there's a there's another thing on that deal. So they first just had fender fuel tanks on them on the back two wheels of that and they oscillated and shook so bad that the tanks broke constantly. So they designed a three part tank, which was humongous. It was as wide as this room, probably when it was put together. And it was made out of polished steel, not stainless steel, but polished steel. And um, with a wire welder, you got to know what you're doing and you got to have it set right because you're, you, it's called spray arc. When you spray wire with argon, it goes <laughs> and it's burning in. And if you set wrong, it's going to pop off and it's going to stick. And they didn't want any grinding on these things. They wanted them good, good, you know. So, damn, I can't remember that engineer's name, the little short guy. He was involved with that with me, too. And Don had these bright ideas. We're going to weld decent core wire. I said, are you serious? You're going to have flux there. How are you going to clean the flux? Well, we're so worried about the overspray. I said, teach somebody to weld. You can weld it with spray, and you're not going to get anything stuck. And we can... There's a paint that you can put on, a white paint. I said, we can put that paint on all them joints beforehand and it wipes off with a rag afterwards. Well, you're going to be the one that designs the first few and they better not be full of sparkles and junk. So, so I did. I said, I'm not going to do it. We put two pieces of this steel together and weld it with, with uh, core wire. And even the engineer said, no, 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 that can't be good, Don. We got to go the other So we went the other way. I welded a left side and a right side, and then they pressure tested them. I had zero leaks on all my welds. And then there's a piece this square, and then there's on both ends, and then there's all around the top and back and forth. And I, I felt pretty proud, but I knew what I was doing. And then they took it over, put the middle section in, and the guys had like seven leaks in their welds. I don't know why that happened, but eventually then I was doing all, th all three systems. Not all the time by myself, but I built all the outside things because we weren't running that fast or that hard. But that was a pretty neat thing. I like that idea. Um, I don't know what they ever came out with it. If they, if it, I think I was not even, I wasn't even involved. Didn't know what they were manufacturing anymore. After, after we got out, kind of kicked out of the cab line, I just went home and 